let's make a platformer. In this one, we are going to start by setting up some of the variables we know we are going to need. We could write our player variables separately, but I'm going to show you a better way to organize your variables using tables. A good practice for organizing your game variables is to put them inside of init. This way, you can call init at any point in your game to reset all the variables and basically restart the game. Now let's create a player table to hold all of the player's variables. Normally, I write all my variable names as obvious as possible so that it is easy to read. But Pico 8 limits the character count, so we try to write our code as efficiently as possible, especially when making full games that might hit the Pico 8 limits. So I'm going to use a lot of abbreviations for these variables, but I will explain each one, and these are commonly used, so you will probably see them in other people's games too. We could even abbreviate player to PLYR or PL or even just P, but I'm going to leave some things long so that the code reads well, and if you want to shorten them, you can. The first variable our player needs is a sprite number, and I'll abbreviate this to SP. This will be used when we draw the player character on the screen and we will change this sprite number to show the animations. Let's just build the sprite drawing code at the same time so you can see where many of these variables will be used. We are going to use the built-in function SPR. There's a video that goes into the details on it, so I won't explain much here. Now we will need to use the player variables. But to do that, we need to understand how tables work. The more you use tables, the better you will be at imagining them in your mind to keep track of them. You can always draw them out too, and I'll do that here so you can follow along easier. So a table is just a way of organizing information into columns and rows. The table's name is the name of the variable that holds the table. So our table name is player. We already gave our table some information that looks just like how we set variables, but the table saves this in a specific way. The variable name SP we can imagine is saved in a left-hand column. The one that we wrote SP is equal to would then be saved in a right-hand column and in the same row. So now the table remembers the left column's SP is linked to the right column's one. Now we use specific words to talk about what is in the left column and the right column. The information in the left column is called a key. You can remember this by imagining that the right column information is locked safe, and in order to get it, you need to use a key. The information in the right column is called a value, and each value is saved to a key. So now that you know what I mean when I say key and value, let's continue. We now need to get the sprite number value from our table. We can't just write SP because it's not actually a variable. It's now a key in our player table. So here's how we do it. First, we write the table name player, then a period or full stop, point, dot. It has many names internationally. Then the key name of the value we want. So we write SP and this will get the sprite number value out of our player table and give it to the SPR function to draw it onto the game screen. The next variables we need are for the position of the player, the X and Y coordinates. For now, I'll just put 59 and 59 center screen. Then we get those values again and give them to the sprite drawing function like this, player.x and player.y. Now the next variables for drawing the sprite is the width and height. These are normally abbreviated to W and H, and their values will be in number of pixels, which is 8 and 8 for our ninja dude. Now this sprite drawing function doesn't measure sprites in pixels, it measures in tiles. Our ninja dude is only one tile wide and tall. One way to do this would be to give our player.width and divide by 8. And that would be great if our player width ever changes, but it's not going to change. And since it will always equal one, then we can just fix this at one tile width and one tile height. 
we'll use the actual width and height player variables for other things like collisions later. The final variable needed for drawing the sprite is if it is flipped or not. In this game, we won't worry about flipping the y-axis unless you want to show your character falling head first or running upside down on the ceilings. For that, you could make two variables called flip x and flip y. But for this one, we'll just prepare one flip for the x-axis for facing left or right. And I'll just name it FLP and start it as false. Then add that to the sprite draw function. Now with these player variables so far, we will be able to change the sprite number to animate it and change the X and Y position to move around the game screen and change the X axis flip to face the player left or right. But that's just the basics. Now let's prepare the player for more advanced controls. And I already know the variables we will need. Later, when we start coding the player movement, I'll go into detail about why we need them and how they work. So here, I'm just going to go over what they are and why they are named a certain way. So next up is how fast the player will be moving. We'll need to keep track of two different speeds, one for moving up or down, and one for moving left or right. We could name it speed, but you'll see some people name it VEL for velocity or ACC for acceleration. But thanks to math and physics, these are commonly named DX and DY. The D stands for delta, a Greek letter used in math to basically mean change. So DX means change in X, which translates into the game as how much we are changing the X to make the player move. If that is at all confusing, it will be explained more when we start using it to make the player move. For now, let's just start them both at zero to simply mean that the player is not moving when they start. The next two are for limiting the speed of the player. So the player will have a maximum DX and DY. We can name them max dx and max dy, but those are hard to read. This is a common problem with variable names, so most programmers separate them using an underscore. That's much easier to read now. The next variable is for how much force we add to the player's movement. The appropriate word for that is acceleration, so let's use ACC here. It's a small amount that will add to the dx over time, so we'll set it at 0.5. The next is how much force we add to the player's jump. This is acceleration too, but upwards, so I'll just call it something like boost, and we'll set this to 4. Almost done. The last one we need is for keeping track of player animation timing, so we'll name it anim for short, and set it at zero. Now these last few are not needed, but I'm using them because they will make the later code very easy to understand. They will be for keeping track of the player's current type of movement. We already drew the player standing, running, jumping, falling, and sliding. We could always check the player movement variables like the DX and DY to know what the player is doing, but the code will just look confusing with a lot of this. If player.dx is not zero and player.dy equals equals zero, then we know that the player is running on flat ground. That's important to understand, but I don't want to read and write that a lot. So I'd rather just check the DX and DY one time then set one or more variables to remember which movement the player is in. We could have one variable and change the value to the type of movement, and that could be checked like this. If player.movement equals equals running, then. Okay, that's definitely better, but another way is to make one variable for each movement type and set them as true or false, so that we can check them like this. If player.running, then. What? Seriously? Yeah, seriously. And since that is so easy to read and we immediately know what it is doing, let's go with that. So we make one for running, jumping, falling, sliding, and one more for knowing when they landed. We start them all at false and the default will be standing. So we don't need a variable for that. If the player isn't doing anything else, then they must be just standing. 
That's more than enough for setting up our player code. Next, we will prepare the player for collision with the map. Then we will be ready to build advanced player controls and learn how they work. I'll answer questions in the comments. And by subscribing, you are telling us you want more.